Do you don't understand? The guy is an angel. He will not leave my side. He's introducing me to doctors. He's bringing me to hospitals. He just, he's just nonstop. And I said to him, Peter, you don't even know me. Why are you helping me this way? And Peter looked at him in the eye and said, listen, what Hillel did for my son 10 years ago, whatever you need, I'm here. Like, do you think when I met this entrepreneur 10 years ago that maybe one day this will, if not save someone's life, at least enhance their life in a real significant way? Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I'm Yaakov Langer. And this week, we have so many heartful moments with Hill Fold. Hill is someone that is the most te technologically connected Jew in the world. Maybe not even, you don't have to take out Jew from that sentence. He is so connected. But he gives us his wisdom and his experiences and his favorite people he's met. And he's met some of the most <laughs> wealthy and most advanced people in the world you'll hear all about it and there's also a lot of heartfelt moments we we speak about his you know for example his brother that uh was murdered but in his last moments of his life he did something so heroic this episode is in memory of shimon david ben yaakov shleima miriam sarah bas yaakov moshe as well as simcha beryl david olive shalom ben Avram Moshe, and you'll hear an incredible Simcha time from Hill himself in this episode. I want to thank our sponsors there at uh, Unrestricted Podcast, a podcast that you should be listening to, as well as Simcha time, the time of the week that will change your day, week, life forever. Here is my conversation with Hillel. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Thank you so much, Hill Fold, for being here. Hill, I feel like I'm saying your name incorrectly because your username you usually has like Hills with a Z Fold in there. Hills Fold. My mom always called me Hills growing up, so that became my brand name online. But uh, Hill Fold, you know, you said it perfectly. The truth is, by the way, mm -hmm. side point: there's no U in Hebrew, so in Hebrew it's always a problem. Like, what's Fold in Hebrew? It's, is it Fold or is it Fold? It's, it's a problem I deal with. But you said it perfectly. I I I go with that another challenge is because there's no real j in hebrew also like we get that i get a for jack i get like a gimbal with a little thing on top i'm like right. that's not real that's that's made up that's not part of the aleph phase that's not a thing <laughs> <laughs> so so tell us more about you growing up where you grew up and what it was like first of all my wife tells me all the time that i didn't grow up so let's start with okay. that but uh no jokes aside so i grew up in in queens and hillcrest um you know, I work. I grew up in a uh, in a family of educators. My parent, my dad, was the principal of a, of a prestigious yeshiva elementary school in Riverdale. Um, my mom was an educator in in various different institutions. Uh, five brothers. We're one. I'm one of five brothers. Uh, so I have four siblings. Um, moved here when I was 15, middle of high school. Um, I know it's your a whole family word. or just you. So I came with my parents. Uh, it was me and my younger brother. My three older brothers at that point were either married. One of my older brothers, Ari, who we'll get to soon. Uh, came by himself before us, but my older one, the ones older than Ari, so Donnie and Moshe were already married, so they came a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, we just, you know, we just, we knew, but basically I grew up knowing that Israel is the place for a Jew to be. Uh, and so our first kind of opportunity, we were on that plane. Uh, now I came in middle of high school, which is by no means an easy age to move to Israel. Um, but I can tell you now, 30 years later, it's the best thing that ever happened to me by a long shot. Uh, and, I, and I mean that both professionally and personally, but we'll get into that. Um, so yeah, now I live in Beit Shemesh, Israel. I got five kids of my own, beautiful home, living the life, man, living the dream. That's really incredible. Okay. So you touched upon your brother and I think let's just dive right in. Your brother was tragically murdered. Um, and just, I, could you give us the background of like what happened there and why man, wanna, he's a you, hero? You want to get in so heavy right in the beginning, man, you're going to lose yeah. listeners. I saw. No, I, it's, it's, I, I remember at the time what had happened and you're like, your brother's legitimately a hero and, and I want everyone to hear about him. Right. So um, I guess the story is that I grew up with Ari um, in the same household and, um, you know, he was big into martial arts. He was a big dude. Like he came to Israel alone. He volunteered for the IDF. He climbed up the ranks in the IDF. You know, when you say hero, you know, that's a word that people use, but in his case, it was he was an actual like warrior. 
Anyway, um, so yeah, so about four years ago, Arab Yom Kippur, uh, he's shopping for his family uh, in a frat 20 minutes from Jerusalem, and a um, lovely Palestinian kid, 16-year-old Palestinian kid, uh, came from behind and stabbed him in a main artery in his neck, um, at which point Ari was basically clinically dead, um, and somehow he was able to chase down the terrorist who was running after his next victim, a woman who had a falafel stand on that location who had previously served this terrorist a falafel. Uh, he was now running after her and Ari literally in his last breath uh, ran after him, jumped over a wall, uh, got down in shooting position and shot him and then collapsed and died. Uh, so he was indeed rewarded the national kind of a hero award, which, you know, I mean, I can't help but think my grandmother in Auschwitz, if you had told her that, you know, one of her grandsons would be a national hero of the state of Israel, I, I don't think she'd be able to even digest that information. Uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, you know, people talk about terror victims and not many people talk about what it does to a family. And unfortunately, it really does rip up a family. Uh, thank God we're a very strong family. We just celebrated my father's 80th the Shabbos. And, you know, all these family celebrations, as happy as they are, there's this little, uh, you know, bittersweet thing. Uh, but, you know, we got to move on with life. And his wife is amazing. She's a warrior and her his kids are unbelievable. And, you know, thank God we do what we can, but definitely not an easy thing to cope with. For you personally, what what was that like when you heard the news? Like, how was it? How did you hear about it? So I'm at a startup's office Sunday morning, and I'm just doing my thing, doing my work. And in between tasks, I open up a you know a, a news website in Israel, and I see that there's a terrorist attack in Efrat, where he lives, uh, and I see a big play button on a surveillance video. So I click play, which is what you do on the internet, and I watch the surveillance video of this kid stabbing this dude. Uh, this big dude, and then this big dude runs after him and shoots him. And I'm like, holy cow, who is this like Superman? And then I asked in the full WhatsApp group, is everyone okay? Thinking, you know, I'd get, of course, everyone's okay. And sure enough, Donnie, uh, was my brother, one above Ari called and said, it's him. It took me a second to realize what he was saying, but then I rushed, you know, rushed to the hospital and basically I was told on the way, stop rushing. So yeah, I mean, listen, it's, you know, the, again, the word trauma Right. I, yeah. You know, getting, we're getting really heavy here, but the word trauma is a word that people throw around. Oh, I'm traumatized. But there's actual, like, you know, clinical scientific symptoms to trauma. For example, I remember everything about that day to like the most, you know, trivial, insignificant details. But the next day, I don't remember a thing. I don't, like, if you told me I went to the, bah- the Bahamas next day, I believe you. Like, I, I don't remember anything, complete black, uh, which is, you know, a symptom of trauma. Um, so, you know, definitely, definitely deeply impacted my mental health. Um, and, uh, again, like, you know, the family is extremely strong. My parents are, you know, un supernaturally strong. Um, but it's hard. It's really, really hard. Everyone copes the way they can cope. You know, everyone's different, but, uh, you know, it definitely threw me into some mental health issues because I didn't know how to cope with this thing. Uh, but thank God, you know, I'm doing okay and we're moving on with life. So it's what's interesting to me is that when I think of, you know, someone who's online and has a presence of just being a voice for Israel and how much good Israel is doing, you have always been there, but you're probably even now on a deeper level after this tragedy to really feel like a part of Israel. Like you, you your brother is embedded in Israel now, like he's an is- Israeli hero now, and you've seen, I guess firsthand the other side of like how terrible they could really be. Yeah. I mean, you know, when people, you know, when, when unfortunately I get into political debates, because sometimes I just can't stay away because you have to remember the politics in Israel isn't politics in America. Politics in Israel is life, right? It's, it's Eretz Israel. Are we giving away parts of Eretz Israel? Like, you know? So when I do get into these debates and someone, you know, calls me out as, as, you know, you're causing damage to the state of Israel. Like, I'm like, dude, like, don't tell me about sacrifice for the state of Israel, you know? Um, but, uh, I mean, listen, yeah, you know, like you said, you know, I, I sacrificed a lot for this country. There's no question. I mean, I I shouldn't, not I, the family did. Right. Um, and you know, my younger brother, Eitan works in the Knesset, right? So, you know, again, it's like New York family that came to Israel. One's a national hero. The other one works in the Knesset. Like it's a crazy thing, but you know, people talk about the American dream. We're living the Israeli dream, you know? That's really beautiful. Okay. So I'll get more into Israel and the beauty of it soon. But first, I, I want to ask, what do you do for a living? I, I, I feel like you're you're everywhere. And it's like, 
I'm like, I'm not even sure exactly what you do. I just know you're connected to like every single company out there. You're not sure what I do? Neither am I. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm a guy who loved tech, like well before it was cool to love tech, right? Before there were startups, before there was social media, before there was an iPhone. I just had a deep passion for technology. And I found myself, you know, out of, out of college with a degree in political science, not knowing, you know, how I'm going to get into tech, but it was clear that I was going to get into tech. And I found myself at my first job working at a tech company, writing their user guides, which as you can imagine, is not a, an optimal career choice for someone with ADHD like myself. Uh, and so I'm sitting there bored out of my mind, you know, writing these user guides for at and and Verizon. And I'm just like, this is not what I should be doing in my life. And I just, I bought a website, I bought a domain and I started to write on the internet. I didn't call it a blog because it wasn't a word. And I didn't have a business model because no one was making money writing on the internet. And I didn't have a business model. I was like, I love tech. I love writing. That's it. And everyone and their mother gave me advice. Oh, do this, make money this way. I'm like, dude, leave me alone. Like, I have a job. This is, you know. But what ended up happening is that startups started to reach out to me. I read your article. I'd love to meet you. I meet these entrepreneurs. And I realized that a lot of these guys are really good at building tech and really bad at building businesses. You know, so I help them in any way I can. And really, you know, I'm not even over, oversimplifying when I say that I built an entire career out of, I don't know, I don't want to call myself a minch, but just trying to help people, you know. And a lot of these entrepreneurs that I helped early on came back to me sometimes a decade later and said, listen, you know, we know what you did for us. We are deeply familiar with your capabilities because you demonstrated them. Now we're a big company. Name your terms. We want to work with you. And so I built this portfolio of companies that I helped grow. What does that mean? I work with them on anything from PR to business development, to fundraising, to social media, to content marketing, depending on the needs of the company. And uh, yeah, I work with these guys on retainer and that's my partner. So that's what I do. Uh, then there are some companies that you know can't afford the retainer, but I you know I want to work with them, so I work with them on equity. They give me some options in the company, but that's kind of my bread and butter. In addition to the startups, I write for basically every leading tech publication in the world, or I don't know about the world, but in, in the states for sure. You know, from you know TechCrunch, the Next Web, Venture Beat, Inc., Entrepreneur, Fast Company, all of them. They're all happy to get free content. I'm happy to get 100 million readers, so it's a win-win. So I produce a lot of content: uh, written content, audio content, video content, just a lot of content. Uh, the third thing I do is a bunch of public speaking. And then the final hat, the fourth thing that I do is, I would say the most absurd, given that I'm just a guy who started writing on the internet. Uh, so I work with a lot of Fortune 500s. I work with Google, I work with Oracle, Microsoft, and a couple of others as like a brand ambassador, influencer, for lack of a better term. I cannot stand that word, but whatever. Um, and I, you know, listen, the bottom line, what do I do? I'm a kid in a candy store. I meet the most amazing people every day. And I'm just, I wake up every morning and I pinch myself that this is what I get to do for a living. What's what's a lesson that the Jewish people could learn from these big tech companies? And what's a lesson that these tech companies could learn from the Jewish people? Great question. So the answer is actually one and the same. And that is that business is not a zero sum game, right? Most people view business as a zero sum game, right? If you're making money, if I'm paying you, I must be losing. But that's fundamentally false, right? So if you're an entrepreneur and I connect you to an investor, you get your money, the investor gets a great deal. Did I lose anything? In fact, one might even claim that I gained my social equity, let's say, right? Because mm -hmm. both now, both sides are like delighted by me, right? But I, even if I don't gain anything, like, did I lose anything? So, you know, a lot of Hasidic Sharebas always talk about the analogy to a candle. Candle has fire, gives its fire, it loses nothing, right? I got to tell you a funny story. I once told that to a guy named Kristoff. I said, Kristoff, business is like a candle. You give your fire, you lose nothing, you only create more fire in the world. And he goes, Hillel, he goes, it's much deeper than that. He goes, if you don't give your fire, you end up burning out. And I'm like, mm. dude, you should be a Hasidic Rebbe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the bottom line is, you know, that's that's my oh, fundamental. The, that was from the Christopher Rebbe, of course, of course. <laughs> there you go. So that, that's that's my fundamental lesson, and that's what I've learned throughout my career. Which is, if you help others win, you end up winning. Like full stop. I'm not talking about karma. I don't pay for groceries with karma. I'm talking about good business, <laughs> good business. And so, you know, we talk about Olam Chesed Ibaneh, right? Judaism is all about Chesed. So I believe that. Chesed isn't just a philanthropic thing. It's actually good business to help others. Uh, and so I think that the business world can learn from Judaism. And I think Jews can learn from some of the best entrepreneurs out there who have focused on giving versus taking. And, you know, it seems maybe someone listening right now that this is such a trivial thing, but it's really not, right? It's really not. And unfortunately, too many people in business are focused on me, 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 instead of you, 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 you. And really, you know, you to give you a very practical example, right? If I interview someone, Right here, I am promoting someone else. So, I'll give you an example. I I interviewed Steve Wozniak, founder of Apple. Crazy story, not for now. But 
when I interviewed him, right? I didn't talk about myself. I talked about him. But what happens to anyone who sees that interview? They're like, oh my God, Hillel interviewed Steve Wozniak. And guess what happens to my brand? He gets elevated. But all I did was focus on someone else. But I get promoted. And just to give you a very t- practical example, what I've learned over and over again is that when you help others win or you pave the road for others to go on their way to success, you join them on that road, period. That's really beautiful. And I- I'm kind of curious, is this such a long story with this whole uh, uh, Steve Wozniak? I don't know how to say his last name, it, but yeah, he's like- a- the- Okay, Listen, one of the founders of Apple. It's like, yeah, he's it's crazy. Beyond one of, it's beyond one of the founders of Apple. Steve Jobs takes all the credit, but he, this guy invented the home computer, period. Like he invented, like we have computers because of him. Um, We're doing this oh, because of him. Thank you, Steve, right. if you're watching you this. Go. So long story short, it was a dream of mine. I uh, don't believe in bucket lists. And if I want to do something, I do it, or at least I try my best to do it. And uh, Waz was, the interview Waz was a dream of mine. I just reached out literally on Facebook Messenger. I'm like, hi, my name is Hillel Fold. You've deeply impacted my career. I'd love to interview you. And he responded right away. And I'm like, oh my God. But he said no. <laughs> so uh-huh. I'm like, so I waited a year. I wrote, I wrote him again. I'm like, you know, it means so much to me. He's like, I can't, I can't do more interviews. Like Steve Jobs had just died. Like the interviews were like, the press was all over him. I waited another year. I wrote him again. I'm like, what would it take? He goes, all right, send me the questions. I email him the questions, thinking he would not even reply to my email or he'd send me like one word answers because why would the founder of Apple even care about it being interviewed by some dude in Beit Shemesh Israel? Like, but he sent me unbelievable answers. And so I published the article and it went, it went a stickle viral. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in the comments on Facebook, Waz comments and he goes, had I known you were this popular, I would let you interview me three years ago. So I was in, yeah. geek, <laughs> I was in geek heaven, but I still, I still had a dream to meet the guy. And a couple of months later, he was coming to Israel and he just reached out. He's like, let's have breakfast. And I find myself in a, the, the lobby of a Tel Aviv hotel with a man who invented the home computer, I'm sitting, talking to the guy. And I'm like, how could it possibly get more surreal than this? Little did I know, incoming rocket from Gaza and I had to rush him to a bomb shelter. Talk wow. About suit. Yeah, it was pretty nuts. So that was, that was that quite is, the morning. That yeah. is an experience that uh, most people can't say they've done. I'm pretty uh, sure I'm the only person on earth who could say I was in a bomb <laughs> shelter with the founder of Apple. Uh, right. But I, that's wow. just one example. But the point is, I've interviewed probably 13, 1400 people and when I interview someone, when I feature someone, when I promote someone, I get promoted, even though I didn't even mention my name. So, you know, that's the fundamental lesson, which is you help others win in business, you end up winning. Like, you know, and, and I want to emphasize, not karma, not karma, business, practical, tachlis, business. And uh, yeah, I've learned that over and over again. That's really crazy. So you've you've interviewed a lot of people, that literally thousands of people, and I know it's a hard question to answer. Who, which person, aside for Steve, um, who has impacted you the most? I love how he's on, on a first name basis now. You and, you and Steve are buddies now. Because huh? <laughs> uh, I'm not going, I feel weird calling him Waz or Waz, like his nickname. I don't know. I'm no not like Waz. boys with him. The, and no then Waz. like, I don't notice what was Niski. I don't know. It's a weird last name. So, um, so I mean, you know, the answer is it is a hard question to answer because I've interviewed so many unbelievable people. But Mark Andreessen comes to mind. Mark Andreessen, if you're not familiar is first of all, the top venture capitalist in the world. The name of his firm is Andreessen Horowitz. First investor in Facebook, first investor in Twitter, first investor in Slack, like a legend. His background is that he invented the web browser, right? Netscape, the modern web browser, he invented it. So he's a legend, right? And to me, like to interview him was like a life, like lifelong dream. And again, just reached out and he agreed to do it. And now we're friends, which is like a sentence I never thought I'd say. I'm friends with Mark Andreessen, but you know, because again, because I'm not monetizing, I'm not always thinking about how to make money, but I'm focused on value. He trusts me as he should. I'm not monetizing that relationship because when I interview, when I introduce him to a startup, everyone's like, take money, take money. And I'm like, dude, like I'm sending an email to a friend. Like, I don't need to take 5% from a company because I sent an email, which theoretically speaking is absurd. Like why would I take money? If I brought a company $50 million, why am I not taking money? The answer is I played the long game and my relationship and that trust that I have with Mark Andreessen is infinitely more important to me than the five percent that a company will pay me, um, so he's one person that comes to mind. But you know, there's, I mean, I've inter- there's amazing people that I've interviewed. Can I ask you how old you are? I'm thirty years old. Okay, so you probably don't remember a TV show called Who's the Boss. I I know the name of it, but I am not familiar with that. So so that was the show when I was growing up, and the, the actress in the show is an actress called Alyssa Milano, and I like I grew up on her, and so when I when I joined Twitter 15 years ago, she was the first person that I followed. And she was like, literally to me, like an icon, right? Anyway, long story short, again, it's a long story, but she followed me back one day. And now, again, the words I never thought I'd say, we're friends. And so I interviewed Alyssa Milano. She has millions of followers. And every time she tweets that article, my 
my servers melt, basically, right? So, you know, I, I'm not going to say she's the most meaningful, meaningful person I've ever interviewed, but it's pretty surreal. Um, you know, venture capitalists in Israel, Googlers at the highest levels, Bradley Horowitz, senior VP at Google, reports, you know, straight to the CEO. By the way, his name is Bradley Horowitz and he's not Jewish. Don't get me started on that. I'm not really sure how that <laughs> happened, but, you know, it, it, really the answer is I've interviewed unbelievable people and, and I just feel extremely fortunate and blessed to even have access to these people, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm having a good time every day. We'll be right back to this week's conversation, and I'm telling you, stick ahead. Stick around, because the last 10 minutes of this episode blows my mind. But first, I need to tell you about another podcast that you should be listening to or watching. Well, I think you can only listen to it, but maybe watch soon. Unrestricted Podcast. Yes, Steve Savitsky is the former president of the OU. Yes, the OU. And he is no longer the president. And he's talking to people that have been in a position of tremendous power and tremendous influence, and they are no longer in that position. They're retired, they've moved on to different positions, different roles, and he sits down with them to ask the questions that you wanna hear. You know, one of the makeup for making a great podcast is getting people to share their real answers. And so often people are so guarded, they're in a position where they can't really share, they can't really say that and this and that. You know, when this mic goes off, there's so many nuggets that people say that I'm like, I wish you would have said that. And they say, I can't, my, my hands are tied, I can't really say it. Steve gets to the bottom of it because these people's hands are not tied. Uh, he has three episodes out so far and I'm gonna go through each of them very quickly. Past episode was with Michal Cutler Wunsch, who is the former is a former member of the Knesset and and she talks about her battle with online Semitism. Really well spoken, very interesting. He interviewed Richard Joel, former president of Yeshiva University, and he talks about life after presidency and, and what his role was and what he did for Yeshiva University, as well as his first episode with Amos Yadlin, who has who was a fighter pilot in the Yom Kippur War, and he talks about the U.S. and Israel relationships and mentions how like the U.S. and Israel, like they're the only, the, Israel's only true friend is the U.S. And uh, Steve is a great podcast host. He's easy to listen to, and I highly recommend them. So go ahead and listen to them. Link in the show notes. Now back to this week's episode. So for someone, and I could definitely get um, an answer here because I also reach out to interview people, but I think for anyone in their life, whenever they're looking, you know, as people go through your li through life, we're always looking to create connections with, with others. And often it could be very scary getting a no, getting rejected. You seem to be very okay with getting no's or no's for now. Like how, what's your philosophy behind there with, getting rejected. Ask me how many people have said no. How many people have said no? no? Not one. Never. No one has ever said no to be interviewed. You know why? And you should know this better than I do. People have egos. And I don't mean that in a mean way, but everyone likes to be interviewed. Everyone likes to be on stage. Everyone likes to show, show their mom that was interviewed. Now, it's up to you to communicate effectively. Find out, you know, if someone's active on Twitter, don't go emailing them. If someone's, you know, an email person, don't go tweeting at them. Like, figure out how to communicate with that person figure out how to, how to write to them. You know, I'd love to pick your brain. Don't be aggressive. Don't be pushy. Don't be salesy. But why would anyone not agree to be interviewed? And people, you know, on every single day, people are like, can I interview on my podcast? I think I asked them, how many viewers, how many listeners? I don't care. Like, what's the worst that could happen? I lose an hour of my life? Great. Who cares? I'm, I'm glad because we have only the three listeners. So, I mean, <laughs> they're very good listeners. So, they're going to be listening. Um, I'm kidding. It's like seven. So, <laughs> so I want to go back to, to before you're talking about, you know, your love for Israel. And, and I, I've heard you talk about this online a lot, that just the beauty of living in Israel. Like I'm a guy, I'm living in the five towns. Convince me why. I mean, I, you don't need to convince me, but like, wh what, what am I missing out on? And what, what do you feel like I'm doing wrong that the fact that I'm not in Israel now? Okay. I, I'll answer you. If you promise me, you won't get angry at me. I, I'm asking for it. So go for right. it. So let's start from the beginning. Number one, I'll, I'll, I'll be a good Jew and I'll answer your question with a question. Is there an event? Think about this question. Is there an event, any event, that if that event takes place, if that event happens, you are out of there? And let me just qualify that question. If there are anti-Semites in Congress, will that scare you? Because that's already done. Are there? If there are pop artists who are full-blown Hitler lovers, just declaring their love for Hitler on mainstream media, would that scare you? Well, that's happened. Jews being beaten up to death in the streets of Brooklyn, well, that's happened. Um, you know, should I go on? I mean, NBA players going full-blown anti-Semite, that's happened. So 
when we asked ourselves as kids, why the heck did the Jews not leave Germany when there were Nuremberg laws, they were legislating against you, what were they thinking? Well, now we know. We know. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, you're comfortable in the five towns. I'm not judging you, by the way, because I came, my parents brought me here. I didn't make any sacrifices. I'm a big talker, but what the heck are you waiting for? That's that's on the that's on the negative side, right? Anti-Semitism has never been this mainstream. It is scary out there. That's number one. Now, th- there are those that will say, oh, but Israel's dangerous. There's terror there. Dude, you don't need to tell me, okay? But let me just tell you one thing. Here's a statistic that my dad likes to say that I love. And this is a, this is a fact. You can look this up. You can do your research. There has never been a 75-year period since Churban Abay, since the temple was destroyed, in which so few Jews have been killed. Let me just repeat that. There has never been a 75-year period since the destruction of the second temple in which so few Jews have been killed. What does that mean? That means that with all the terror and every life that's lost to terror and to wars is a tragedy in its entire world. Having said that, take a step back, look at things in perspective. This country is defending us. And even if we're being attacked, it's up to us how we react and how we respond and how we defend ourselves. We're not at the mercy of another country. And when we are at the mercy of another country, open history books. Look what happened, right? No, it won't happen in America. I grew up saying that. Look what's going on now. I mean, literally, you five towns. I just got off the phone with a guy an hour ago in Englewood in New Jersey, mainstream from neighborhood. He, he had scars from like anti- anti-Semitic attack, physical scar. Like he was actually like, what has to happen? You know, so, you know, Israel is, is it's our problem. It's how we deal with it. It's up to us. That's number one. But I don't want you coming to Israel for fear. That's not the right reason to come to Israel. What I will say is that when I was growing up, and probably when you were growing up, you know, to come to Israel, by definition, you have to lower your quality of life. By definition, you you know, you know, drive a, a less good car, drive, you know, make less money. By definition, you couldn't get tuna fish in this country. Like it was a third world country, basically. Today, like, is there a siren? Do you hear a siren? There's a siren by me. Sorry, oh. I mean, it's it? proof. Look, it's not a safe place here in America. <laughs> good timing. Um, yeah. So right now, and I'm not even talking about spirituality that's another discussion but materialistically like i'm look i mean i'm living you know in, in beit Shemesh. my entire neighborhood is woodmere people or my rabbi rosner is my name my rabbi i'm sure you know him um you know I, I mean working with unbelievable innovators making good money driving nice cars living the life i don't i do not feel in fact not only do i not feel i know that my friends in the five towns some of my best friends live there and they're not living better I'm materialistic. They're not living better lives than I am. Let alone spirituality. That's a whole different discussion. But why, my question is, again, as a good Jew, I'm going to answer you the question. You're asking me, oh, why, why would you come? Why should you come to Israel? Or why would you come? My answer is, why would you not? What's stopping you? Like, you, again, you don't have to lower your quality of life. You don't have to worry about anti-Semitism. You're home, right? I heard someone say something beautiful. Someone said to me, you can succeed in America despite being a Jew. But in Israel, you can succeed because you're a Jew. And I love that. Mm-hmm. And, and someone else said to me something that I also loved, which is, he said, I made Aliyah, I moved to Israel, not because I'm a Zionist, but because I'm a capitalist, right? Because when yeah. it comes to technology and business and innovation, this is where it's at. So I don't really truly understand um, American Jews who are just with their hand, head in the sand saying, no, everything will be okay. Everything will not be okay. We know what's going to happen. In fact, if I may for one second put on my, uh, my Rebbe hat, uh, I'm not a Rebbe, don't have smicha, I'm just making a joke, but- uh, you know, we know the Pasuk, right? You know the song, right? Did you ever think about those words? What does it mean, So the word ovdim means they're lost. Avud is lost. And the, there are two types of galuses. There's ovdim eretz ashur. Ashur means happiness. It also means, you know, wealth with an ayin. But there are, there are galuses where we're rich, we're happy, and we're ovdim, ideologically lost. Who are the most liberal people in America today? Jews. We're ideologically lost. Assimilation, it's, right? And then there's the other type of galos. We're persecuted, Mitzrayim, Nazi Germany, Greek, Roman, you know, spat everywhere, right? In the times of Mashiach, we bo- both types of galos are going to be but what people don't realize is that every time we were over the merits ashur, it turned into nidachim merits Mitzrayim. We were the most comfortable people in Germany, the most. And not only were we the most comfortable, but we were... We were the most assimilated. We were saying to the Germans, dude, we're just like you. Stop it. Like, we are just like you. And that's when anti Semitism always shows its ugly head because God is saying, in my opinion, stop it. You're not just like them. And if you don't remember that, I'm going to remind you. 
God forbid I'm not implying that the Holocaust happened because of assimilation. Oh, God forbid I would never say such a thing. But the point is, you look when 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 our quote unquote light goes out, when we're like, we're, we don't want to be the light unto the nations. Let us just be like them. And the nations say, dude, I need your light because without your light, you know, you're the lighthouse. And without your light, our ships are lost at sea. We need your light. You want to put out your light? We'll remind you who you are. And so, you know, today we're over the America shore in America. Um, you know, it's it's crazy. I mean, you know, when I grew up, we were talking about assimilation. We were talking, about, yeah, but it doesn't happen from communities. I don't know anyone who's assimilated. I got first cousins. I got I got friends that grew up from like literally went to Shiva in Beit Shemesh who are married to Goyim. So it's pretty mainstream and it's not slowing down. And I think you should get the heck out of there. That's the bottom line. Okay, I I hear that and uh, well said. So uh, something. Uh, by the that, way, by the way, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I just want to say one more thing. Sure. We also said growing up, never again, right? We always said never again. And the truth is never again. It will never happen again, but only because of one reason. Not because of America will prevent it from ever happening again. The only reason that never again is an accurate statement is LL.com. That's it. That's it. Because we can get on a flight and come here. Because if we didn't have Israel, you better believe it'll happen again because it's already happening again. So, you know, we are very fortunate to have Israel. And I think that, I'm, again, I'm making a generalization, but I think many times American Jews are like, they have it in the back of their head. They're like, I can go there if, you know, if it hits the fan, right? Don't wait. Don't wait. This is, we're, we're here with open arms. Like, come home, you know? Really beautiful. Really beautiful. So something that you do that I personally really enjoy is you, I don't know if it's every single day, but it's, it's very often, um, almost every day that you give someone a shout out on LinkedIn and you, you always, you're so good at finding the good qualities about the person. Uh, why do you do that? Like what's, what's, the, what's the reason behind it? So, I mean, it started because, uh, before COVID I was meeting people and every time I'd meet someone, I'd take a nice picture with them and I'd write a post about them because I just like doing that, which I want to talk about in a second because I have an interesting thing to tell you, but I started to, and I was doing this for years and then COVID hit and I have no more, inter, I have no more meetings face to face. I'm like, I'm going to stop. I love, I love doing it. I love giving people props. I love it. Right. So I'm like, I'm not going to stop. So I'll take my 15,000 selfies from the last 10 years. And I'll do a post every day. And so every day I've done, I, I do this post. I switch off between men and women every single day. I've done 623, I believe. And first of all, it's Lishma. Like it is Lishma. I love the people. I love, I love featuring. I love giving people a stage. Having said that, if you want to put on your cynical marketing ad for one second, it, it comes back to what we said in the beginning, right? So if your LinkedIn feed is full of 623 people that Hello Fold featured, and those 623 people have only two things in common. One, they are rock stars. Why are they rock stars? Well, in the post, I explain why they're rock stars. And the mm -hmm. second thing they have in common is all 623 of those rock stars are standing next to someone in that picture. And that's me. But what does that say about me? So it's marketing, right? You pave the road for others. You promote others. You get promoted. So again, I do it Lishma. But it definitely brings real marketing value. Um, and I love doing it. I'll be honest with you, I love doing it. I love hearing about business deals that were facilitated through those introductions. Right? I've had, I don't know, probably 100 people reach out to me and say, I met this guy through this post and it ended up being like, so I love that stuff. You know, It really makes me very happy and I just love doing it. I love giving other people a stage. I love the idea that you said before and you're like tying it in again is that like this idea that we, I guess maybe it's human nature for us to think that if I'm going to give away something, then I'm going to lose it. But right. you're saying literally it's not. And, and I like what you said also. It's not, it's not just karma. It's, it's a reality that you could yep. literally detect and see and feel. Yep, 100%. Um, I, I, I want to say one more thing about this because this is an unbelievable, unbelievable thing. I, I haven't spoken about it. I think maybe I spoke about it on like one interview, but I haven't spoken about it very often. So you know, one might say I'm a Rambam Jew. I'm, a, I'm not a voodoo kind of Jew. I don't, I, not to say Kabbalah is not real. I just don't, I can't, it doesn't resonate, okay? And if you had told me, you know, 10 years ago about the importance and the significance of a person's name, I would have been like, all right, dude, like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? <laughs> but I got to tell you these two stories and they're unbelievable. So when Ari was born, my parents named him Ari. And his name was Ari, it wasn't Arie. Meaning some people call their kids Ari, Arie, and they're short for Arie was Ari. Ari's name was Ari. And many people asked my parents, like, where'd you get that name from? And they were like, I don't, we just love the name. They didn't really think much of it. Anywho, uh, Ari grew up to what, you know, he was. And he had a couple of, I would say, extraordinary characteristics that really, um, I guess, characterized him as a person. So here are a couple of examples. Number one, like I said before, the guy was a warrior. He came to Israel. He conquered this land like hardcore warrior. 
That's one. Two, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and he'd be like debating some anti-Semite on social media about like Israel. And I'd be like, Ari, what are you like, what are you doing? The guy's not even listening to you. He he was defending Israel 24-6. The guy did not sleep. Okay. Literally, I don't know when he slept. That's two. Three, he had a deep, deep passion for tefillah, for davening, specifically Kriyashma. But in general, davening was big, 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 important kind of priority for him in life. And Tzitzis, super passionate about Tzitzis. So those are a couple of things that really characterize Ari. Anyway, after he was murdered, my parents opened the Torah. And they're like, where did we get that name Ari from? Like, where is the word Ari in the Torah? And they found that there are two mentions of the word Ari in the entire Torah. And sit down for this, because this is going to blow your mind. So just to, just to hazard, just to go over what we said, Ari's characteristics. He was a warrior who conquered the land. He didn't sleep. He was passionate about davening, about Sitis, right? And Eretz Yisrael in general. And, oh, and one more thing, specifically the, 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 the tefillah of Kriya Shema. Super passionate about Shema. I, I don't know where those specific things came from, but that was Ari. So after the murder, they opened the Torah, and I'm now going to read to you. Sit down for this, man. You're going to get chills. This is wild. The two mentions of the word Ari in the entire Torah. Are you ready? The first one. They crouch, they lie down like a lion, right? That's the first time the word Ari is mentioned in the Torah. Now, if I'd say to you, define to me what a lion is, right? You would say the king of beasts. You'd say many things about a lion. Listen to what Rashi says. Okay, and I'm reading word for word. He lies like a lion. This is what Rashi says. like Uncleus. And what is a lion? Listen to this. They will settle their land with strength and might. Like, what? That's a lion? And that was Ari. That's one. Wait till the second time. Second time in the entire Torah. Second and only other time in the entire Torah. Right? How does the Torah explain what an Ari is? What, are the, what is the characteristic that it, the Torah gives to explain what a lion is? It could have given a lot of things. What does it say? Lo yishkav ad teref. A lion doesn't sleep until it consumes its prey. That was Ari. He didn't sleep. But wait, listen to what Rashi says. This is just crazy. Okay? Heinam kilavi akum. Sheheinom bim yishmatam shacharis. In the morning, hein mitgabrim kilavi v'chari. They overcome, I guess, whatever that means, to grab the mitzvot. Lachtof et ha-mitzvot. To grab the mitzvot. Now, Rashi could have given 613 examples of the mitzvot. He could have given any example. What does he say? Reading word for word. To grab the mitzvos, talit, shma, that was Ari's autobiography. Mamish. My parents saw this and were like, what the heck? Like, wild. So after, you know, I heard this from my father, I was like, oh my God, like a person's name has real significance. And I started to think about my own name. And so I was talking to someone about it. He said to me, what do you love doing in life? What do I love doing in life? We were just talking about it. I love promoting others, right? The person said to me, well, what does that make you feel? Like, how do you feel when you promote others? I'm like, I, I, I love this stuff. I, I feel alive when I promote others. So like, okay, you feel alive. Great. What else do you feel? I'm like, honestly, it's like part of my essence. Like I, I really, it makes me feel whole when I'm promoting others. Okay. So promoting alive and whole. You with me? Yeah. He says to me, what's your name? I said, Hillel. He says, Hillel what? Hillel to praise Chaim, my second name, Shlomo, Shalim. Hello, Chaim Shlomo. The praise wow. makes me feel alive and makes me feel whole. That is my name. I mean, you can't, listen, there's no denying that. Like anybody who knows me knows that my core, my essence is promoting others. That's what I do. What does Hillel mean? Hillel means lehalel, to praise. It's like, what? for 40 years, I didn't think about this. It's totally nuts. So I just wanted to share those two things. It's just crazy. It's really beautiful. I'm like trying to like put together Yaakov heels. Uh, do I like heels are okay? Do I, do I have like a thing for heels? I don't know. Um, what's, your, what's, your sure what's your middle name? Nothing. My name's Yaakov and last name Linger. Yeah. There's something. There's something. I'm not sure. Think about it. Well, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. But um, okay. That's really beautiful. That's really cool. We'll be right back this week's episode. But first, let me tell you about the revolution that you could be a part of. I love doing ads where you could actively do something. You don't need to buy anything here. You don't need to go online and type in a promo code for it. No, you got to just do something that will 100% guaranteed, money back guaranteed, help you enjoy your life. Okay, so 
Simcha Beryl David Alev Shaman Ben Avram Moshe was someone who's incredibly special and he is unfortunately no longer with us, but he lived his life for others. If he had to go out of his way for someone, he would do it. My mother-in-law literally car broke down, not broke down. She had a flat tire and in the good parking lot and boom, Simcha came out of nowhere and he changed her tire. She knew who his family was, but he's like, I'm here to help. And that's what it is. And then he left, he fixed that and left. We need to emulate people like him that really just go out of our way to help other people, give them more joy in their life. So we want you to actively think, say, what could I do in this next day, this next week to make someone else's life better, happier? And then once you do it, don't, don't hide it. Be proud of it. Share it. You know, we see so many buildings with people's names on it. And that's not something we want to hide, right? We want us to tell people, yes, someone donated this, because we're proud of it. Look, look how much people are learning Torah in this building. And thanks to these people over here. So similarly, we want you to brag about it. Well, I don't know if brag is the right word, but we want you to discuss it and talk about it at your Shabbos table. And that's what we call Simcha time, sharing that moment of chesed, that act of kindness that you went out of your way. And Again, yes, we do chesed all the time, but we want you to be active and say, this actually, I went out of my way to do chesed and then discuss it around the Shabbos table. Hey, what did you do for Simcha time this week? I personally did it this past week and we spent like 30 minutes on it going around the tables by my in-laws and everyone was just discussing like different things that they did. Uh, it, it will make you happier. It'll make you happier person. It will help out another person. And um, it's really, really a nice idea. And this this idea of Simcha time should be Le'ilu Nishmas, Simcha Beryl, David, Alev Shalom, Ben Avram, Moshe. And um, to go the step further in the show notes, you can go to simchatime.org and you can share the Simcha time. We are confident there will be tremendous, incredible stories coming out from this movement. So we want to hear your story, even if it's amazing and great for sure share it and even if it's, it's simple and like you're like okay you know this was a nice little simple time i did share it with the simple time team we love feedback and in the show notes you can go ahead and click on the link and in this episode with hillel you will hear an incredible simple time i asked him about it and it was probably my favorite moment in this entire episode so stick around till the very end now back to this week's episode so as we wind down this conversation i like to ask a few questions that i deem as fun out of the 613 mitzvahs, is there one particular mitzvah that holds a special place in your heart? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I know it's cliche, but I have to say Shabbos because I'm just 24, 6. Like, I mean, if you saw my, my, my scent items on a regular basis, you'd, like, you'd get dizzy. Um, so for me to, you know, A, sign off, but more importantly, to let my followers know that I'm signing off, I've had unbelievable stories of unaffiliated Jews who reached out and said, I haven't lit Shabbos candles in 40 years and you're signing off posts have inspired me or someone else wrote me and said, I never kept Shabbos in my life. We're completely unaffiliated. We kept Shabbos for the first time because of your post. So I love that stuff. And, wow. you know, I'm not going to lie and say Shabbos isn't challenging for me because my hands shake, but uh, no, I mean, it's Shabbos is a huge gift. I know that, you know, it is a gift. Uh, so for me, I would have to say Shabbos, um, but no, the list is long. I mean, anything from Chesed to Tzadka to Kippur Avayim to there, there's a long list, but if I had to choose one, it would be Shabbos. That's a very beautiful answer. If there's one person from history that's uh, no longer with us or someone from recent history is no longer with us that you could spend an hour with, who would it be and why? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, should I give a meaningful answer or the not meaningful answer? And the not meaningful answer is Steve Jobs, simply because I want to get a peek into that guy's brain, like how his brain operates, because okay. it's like his brain was made out of different like the DNA than the rest of us, you know? Uh, and I mean, I don't know if you read the book Jaws, but that guy, that guy was like, off like just off his rocker and i would just love to <laughs> just to love to meet him but more meaningfully rabbi Sachs, not even a question i mean i quote rabbi Sachs every single friday on my different torah and one of my biggest regrets in life is not having met him i think he was one of the most brilliant minds of our generation by a huge margin so definitely wish i could spend an hour with that guy i was i was devastated when he passed away because i reached out to interview him um, and his team sent back that, you know, very kindly, basically, like now is not a good time. And I didn't know that he was was sick at the time. Yeah. And then I then like I went on my phone. I think it was Matzi Shabbos for us, like near Pesach time. And I'm like, I'll never be able to talk. I mean, I could learn his Torah, which is the beautiful part. Right. But like, I'll never be able to talk to him. Right. 
I don't yeah. uh, I don't subscribe to many email newsletters just because I get too many emails as is, but I, I read his his weekly, you know, Torah on the different, you know, every week. And it's unbelievable. I mean, again, you, you could see the level of brilliance in this guy. I mean, you know, I try to uh, sign off every Friday with a, a Torah Torah that has, I would say, global appeal. My audience is highly secular or even not Jewish. So me writing about like from, you know, advice wouldn't resonate. So I always try to tie it into either business or leadership. And it's just unbelievable. How he does this every week. But, you know, things that we grew up learning and reading every single week, whoever thought that you could learn about business from Yosef and Sadiq, right? Like, so it's, it's, it's different level brilliance. And I, and I, and I deeply regret not having met him. What's the worst advice that you've ever received? Monetize. Monetize what? Like everything you everything, do, content? Everything. Take money for this. Take money for that. Don't do this without money. Don't, take money from startups. Take money from investors. Take, dude, like you, when you provide real value, but not, again, not abstract, but real value, what you do is you show a company what you can do for them. Let them reach the conclusion that they want to pay you. And it works. Again, I'm not talking about being like an idiot. I'm not going to like go work for a company for hundreds of hours. So they're not paying me. But 99% of you know the things that a startup has to deal with or challenges or things that I can help them in two seconds, right? Not because I'm a rock star, but because I've spent many, many years building up my network. And so I can now leverage that network to help an, you know, an entrepreneur. And so instead of saying, oh, I'm going to connect you to my friend, but pay me, I'm going to really connect you to my friend. My friend's happy. You're happy. Eventually, you as the entrepreneur that I helped, you're going to come back to me and you're going to say to me, dude, like what you've done for me, like take my money. And so <laughs> play, playing the short game is just bad business. Like if you think about it, you know, if you really think about it, business models, traditional business models are, are completely illogical because most companies or most people or most vendors, let's call them, come to companies and say, pay me and I'll do something, which means that you're paying me on credit. I haven't done anything yet. Whereas I come and I say, let me help and I deliver. And then when the company comes back to me and they need me, then I have the leverage. And then I define the terms. So monetize is the worst advice I ever got. Make money, put ads, be Stop that. Focus on value. Money will follow. Period. I love that. I really love that. Um, something that we recently started doing is is this concept called Simcha Time. Lilu Nishma, someone named Simcha. And the goal is he was someone that really did things for others and and um, went out of his way. When's the last time that either you went out of your way for someone to do a chesed for them or someone did it for you and like you saw the result? Oh my God, I, I don't even know where to, how to choose a story to answer that question. There have been hundreds of stories of me helping somebody. I'll, I'll give you one example. About 10 years ago, I get, a, uh, I get an email from a, an entrepreneur. He says to me, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm 19. I have the startup idea and I'm told you're my guy. So I said to him, what does that mean? What do you need? He goes, I need introductions to investors. I'm like, great. Send me your investors deck and I'll pass it on to investors. He goes, no, I want to meet you. I'm like, dude, like, don't waste your time or money buying me coffee. I'm happy to help. You don't need to meet me. He goes, no, I want to meet you. So I go meet the guy. He's a, like, he's a kid, you know, he's pretty clueless about business, but okay. I made a couple of introductions for him and that was that. A couple of years later, he calls me up. He says, we sold the business. Like, Mazel Tov, super happy for you. And then he drops a bomb on me out of nowhere. I'm like, like, I was like, Mazel Tov, like, goodbye. Like, have a great life. And he's like, no, no, my dad wants to meet you. I'm like, what? Your dad? What? What? He goes, my dad wants to know who this guy is that helped his son without asking for anything in return. I'm like, oh, who's your dad? Tells me his name. I Google him. Top, top, top cancer research expert. Top. I'm like, wow, I'd love to meet your dad. I meet him at Mr. Broadway. Amazing dude. Like really fascinating guy. Amazing meeting. And that was the end of that. At the end of the meeting, I said, thank you. It was fantastic to meet you. Have a good life. And over the next seven years or so, the guy sends me a WhatsApp message every, I don't even know, six months, you know, good job is things like we're not, we weren't in touch. But a year ago, a little bit less, I'm at my parents' house in Jerusalem, sitting on the couch. My mom's sitting right across from me and she gets a phone call and her face turns white. I said, what happened? She goes, a childhood friend was diagnosed with very, very bad cancer. So I said to her, listen, I know this, this guy, you know, and she said, oh, please, please write him. So I, sitting on my parents' couch in, in Jerusalem, I'm like, pick up my phone. I WhatsApp this guy. His name is Peter. I said, Peter, how are you? You know, I have this family friend, pancreatic cancer. And he's like, here are the 10 names that are the biggest names in pancreatic cancer. Here's their names. Here's their email. Here's their phone numbers. Wow. Take that information. I give it to the patient. 
I said, you know, here's this guy, Peter, and he, you know, he's happy to help. Here's some information. The guy's like, oh my God, that's so nice of him. He's like, pardon my question, but do you think maybe Peter would be willing to speak to me directly? I'm like, let me try. I WhatsApp Peter. I'm like, Peter, I know you're super busy and pardon the chutzpah, but like, any chance you could speak to him directly? He goes, of course, give him my WhatsApp. Give him his WhatsApp and I step out. And I'm like, good luck, guys. A couple of weeks later, the patient calls me and he says, who is this Peter guy? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you don't understand. The guy is an angel. He will not leave my side. He's introducing me to doctors. He's bringing me to hospitals. He just, he's just nonstop. And I said to him, Peter, you don't even know me. Why are you helping me this way? And Peter looked at him in the eye and said, listen, what Hillel did for my son 10 years ago, whatever you need, I'm here. Like, do you think when I met this entrepreneur 10 years ago that maybe one day this will, if not save someone's life, at least enhance their life in a real significant way? So I met this entrepreneur 10 years ago who I didn't think I should have met, meaning any logic or any traditional business advice would have told me, don't go meet him, you'll waste your time. But a guy wanted to meet, so I met him. And it led to something unbelievable. And that's literally one of hundreds and hundreds of stories that have happened to me over the years that were a chain of events that happened that had I had one of those events not taken place, then the rest would have fallen, you know, and it led to amazing things. And and like I said in the beginning, when you do good, it leads to good things, period. That's that's really, really, really epic. Uh, for just closing remarks, if there's one piece of practical advice that you could give to the uh, our three to seven listeners, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, how what would you tell them to do? Like practically, they want to get out there more. Yeah. They want to to network. They they want to grow. They want to be happier in life. What would you advise them? Okay, so here here's my thought. Like. Imagine every meeting that you have, whoever you're meeting, all you think about during that meeting is how do I help this person, right? You take yourself completely out of the equation. You don't think about yourself at all. Your focus is how do I help this person? Let's dissect and analyze what would happen. What would happen is as follows. One, you'd strengthen relationships because you're helping people all the time. Two, you'd learn to overcome diverse problems because you're always solving problems. Three, you'd build a reputation of being indispensable to people. Four, you'd have a bank of favors to call upon down the road, right? Now, again, it comes back to the beginning of our discussion today, and that is when you focus on paving the road for others to go on their way to success, you end up joining them, right? And so focus your time and resources on helping others, period. Not, not, okay, I'll help them for a month, but then I need to monetize. No, keep going, keep helping. I'll I'll read you an email I got from a Silicon Valley-based startup worth billions of dollars with a B, okay? They came out on the iPad with their app about 10 years ago, and I loved the app. I just loved it. I started to write about them. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. There was no relationship there. They're not connected to Judaism, to Jews, to Israel, nothing. There's no nothing there. But I genuinely, authentically love the product. So I started to write about it. And I'll be honest, the thought of asking them for money didn't even cross my mind. Who the heck am I? This is a $2 billion company. I'm sitting at home one day, minding my own business, and I get the following email from the CEO of a tech company in, in Palo Alto worth $2 billion. The subject of the email is thank you. Hillel, I won't ever forget your enduring support for what we have been building over the years. It's time we got you some stock and asked you to be a formal advisor. I know you wouldn't ask for this, but it's the right thing to do. I hope you'll accept. We are only just beginning, and I could really use your advice when you have the time. And the guy gave me more option than his company that he gave that he gave his employees, right? And again, I didn't ask for anything. I didn't even have a hobby to ask for anything. I just focused on what I can do for this company. And I didn't do it because I wanted to get something. I did it because I love the product and I and it deserved my promotion. So I promoted it and it led to this. And that's literally one of hundreds of, I mean, every company that pays me are companies that I did this for. I never, I never came to a company and said, pay me. I just said, let me help, you know? I mean, literally, I, I could go on for hours. I, there are so many unbelievable stories I don't know. It, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. But really, that's what, again, that's, I know it's- G- nice. Give me another story. I, I, I want another story. I like your stories. It's giving me a lot of chizek. Give, give me another story. Okay. But this is a complicated one. All right? You need to focus. How many, how many coffees okay. do you have? You have, you have coffee? Today? I don't do, I don't do coffee. I would not be focused if I had, I would be jumping if you I had don't coffee. don't do coffee. I am so, so no. sorry, sir. Oh my gosh. I thought you could say you're jealous of me. I am so, so sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so listen to this story and it's, 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 I don't know what, it's remarkable, okay? 
All right. It's five stories that come together last week. All right. All right. Bear with me here. 10 years ago, there's a guy, I'm going to, I'm going to try to leave names out because it, there's a lot of sensitivity here. So I'm going to, I'm going to use fake names. Okay. There's mm-hmm. a guy named David and David is not from, and he's volunteering for, um, some stuck organization packing, uh, food for poor people. And right alongside him is this elderly gentleman packing with him. And David says, hi, my name is David. What's your name? And he's like, my name is Michael. And Michael is a very, very famous tech entrepreneur, like a very famous godfather of Israeli tech. Like he's one of the biggest inventors. Not going to go into details because that would identify who he is, but big, big name. So David and Michael become good friends. All's good. Story number one. Okay. Story number two. Three years later, uh, Michael gets a phone call from a, let's call it an A-list celebrity in Hollywood who says to him, listen, I have a VC, I'm a venture capitalist, and I want to open up shop in Israel, and I need someone to manage my money in Israel. So Michael's like, listen, I could send you someone who has experience, or I could send you this guy who's a super mensch. He is a hard worker. He's an amazing guy. His name is David. And this uh, this, this, uh, celebrity says to Michael, I trust you, introduce me. So Michael then introduces the celebrity to David, and David ends up being a partner and managing his money in Israel. Second story, okay? Third story. About four years ago, Erev Shavuos, I'm sitting at home, two hours before Chag, I get a, a call saying that that celebrity, that same celebrity is in Israel looking to meet startups. Come meet him in his hotel in Tel Aviv. Two hours before Chag, I said to my wife, I need to go to Tel Aviv. She's like, are you like, what? <laughs> like Chag's in two hours. I said to her, yeah, but this celebrity is in Israel. She goes, really? Can I come, right? He's a, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a very famous guy. Anyway, so she agreed. I go meet him in his hotel room in Tel Aviv. I'm sitting in this room with this celebrity, one of his partners who's also very famous, and this David guy, right? You with me so far? I'm with you. Okay, so we had the meeting. It was great. And then me and David continued this friendship over WhatsApp. We became good friends and we're good friends since. Okay, that's story number three. Story number four. 10 years ago, I'm a mentor at Microsoft. Microsoft has an accelerator. I'm teaching you know, CEOs marketing. And I'm mentoring this, this one CEO who's just like this super humble dude, just like sits in the corner of the room, just working like no, you know, no noise, no whatever. And I'm, I'm doing my thing. And sure enough, he builds a very, very successful company. The name of the company I could say is Apps Flyer. What do they do? They do what's called app attribution, which means that if I have an app, right? If I'm a developer and someone downloads my app, for me to do effective marketing, I need to know how they found me. Did they come to me through Google? Did they find me through Facebook? How did they find me? Right? That's called app attribution. Apps Flyer, this CEO founded, is the leader of the space, multi billion dollar company. So I'm mentoring this guy. He then builds this company, multi billion dollar company. Two years in, he reaches out to me one day and he says, I need a marketer. I need someone to lead my marketing. I said, Okay, I have a friend. He introduced him. He ends up hiring him. His name is Ron. Ron now leads marketing for Apps Flyer. Okay, that's story number four, right? We're up to four? Okay. Yes. Five. About um, three years ago, I get a I get an email from an American guy from guy. Hi, hello. My name is Yonatan. I have this um, I have this startup. Not going to name the name. It's we build basically tablets that are intercoms for your house. I'd love to send you a few. I'm like, great. Sends them to me. I have them. It's right here in front of me, literally. Um, and he, great. And you know, we're in touch. Whatever. A couple of years later, he writes me. He says. You know, I was uh, in deep negotiation with Amazon and they ended up stealing my technology and building Alexa. It's, it's his technology and he basically went out of business. And he's like, I have an expertise on building tablets. What the heck am I going to do with that? Like, he, he, so, okay, that's the fifth story. Final story. Two years ago, I get an email from a local entrepreneur named Donnie. Donnie has an app for um, dementia, an app for people with dementia. And he says, I need some advice. I go meet him, give him some advice. That's the end of that. Okay. A month ago, I get a WhatsApp from David, right? The guy who's now managing the money of that celebrity. He says, do you know this guy, Donnie? He has an app for dementia. I'm like, yeah, of course I know him. He goes, can you introduce me? I'm like, why? Like, this is an early stage company. You're an investor who invests like, you know, multi, multi million dollar in much later companies. Like, why do you just introduce me? Okay. I introduce him. Donnie calls me last week. He says, come meet me. I go meet him. He goes, all right, you're not going to believe this. He goes, this David guy, after I introduced him, called him. And he said to Donnie, he's like, listen, you have an app for dementia, right? He goes, yeah. He goes, listen, my wife, David's wife, he says, my wife has a has a business where she builds digital clocks. And she had this idea. She wanted to build a clock for people with dementia with pictures of their kids on it and their schedule and whatever. But what does she know about like dementia? So she starts Googling it and she comes across your app. 
And so she says to her husband, who's a big investor, get me in touch with this Donny guy. Her husband then Googles Donny and sees that I'm connected to him. So he reaches out <laughs> to me and says, please introduce us. So this Donny guy, I'm meeting with him last week, he says to me, he called me and he said to me, how much money do you want to raise? And Donny's an engineer. So he just like threw out a number and this investor's like, I'll double it. He goes, first of all, I wanted to thank you for that introduction. Great. Then he says to me, but I have two challenges that I doubt you can help with, but I figured I'd ask. Okay, what are they? He goes, the first thing is, he goes, a month ago, my app was completely failing. No one was downloading it and I was ready to close up shop. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to run an experiment before I close down the whole business. I'm going to start charging for my app. Let's see if people pay for it. Who knows? Sure enough, traffic started to skyrocket. People start downloading and paying for his app. And he's like, I have no idea where these people came from. He's like, I need app attribution. I need to figure out where they came from. But I'm a small little startup and I apps flyer. They're a multi-billion dollar company. They won't even look at my direction. I need to get in touch with them. Do you know anyone? I'm like, I was, <laughs> I was the CEO's mentor and I got him a CMO. So in the meeting, in Cafe Ramon and Beit Shemesh, I pick up the phone. I call the CMO, Ron, whose job I got. You know, I got his job. And I say, Ron, he goes, how are you? Blah, blah. I'm like, listen, I'm sitting with this guy. He's trying to get in touch with you. He's like, what does he do? I'm like, he has an app for Dementia. He's like, he has an app for what? I'm like Dementia. He goes, are you for real? I'm like, yeah, why? He goes, my mother-in-law was just diagnosed. I'm like, okay, put them in touch. Check. Now he has one challenge solved. He says, I have another challenge that even for you, I, I, there's no way you can help me with this. I'm like, what? He goes, I'm selling an app for dementia. People with dementia, like, it's not so easy for them to go to the app store. Like, you know, it's kind of like, what am I even doing? He's like, my dream is to sell them a tablet with the app pre-installed. But what the heck do I know about building tablets? Is there any way you know anyone who builds tablets? <laughs> so I connected him to Yonatan. And I want you to think now about the chain of events that had to happen for this guy to have an investment, app attribution, and a tablet. So David had to be had to be volunteering. Michael had to be there. Michael had to recommend David to this celebrity. They had to invite Nero Fuest to the room. I had to continue the friendship with David. David had to his wife had to be running it, it like 50 different events that had one of them not happened. This guy would not have built a successful business helping people with dementia. And it all comes down to Chesed. It all started from volunteering. So and again, one story, but it, they're endless. So that's what I keep learning. You do good, good things happen, period. That's amazing. That's really amazing. For those that want to connect with you to get in your network, where could they find you? Where could they consume your content? Everywhere. Um, I mean, you know, I'm very active on all platforms. MySpace? <laughs> you nice said everywhere. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Don't challenge me, man. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll, I'll go open a MySpace account right now. Um, <laughs> no, so I've been very active, you know, I, I guess on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and you can reach out anywhere or hillelfold.com and you can just reach out through my website. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that no one's ever reached out to me and hasn't gotten a response within a couple of seconds. And if I'm in the middle of a meeting, an hour max, but I'm very, very responsive. So if I can help anyone, any of your listeners or viewers with anything, I'm happy to do that. Just ping me and the answer will be yes. If it's something I can be helpful with, if it's not, I'll tell you. Hillel, you are great. Keep up the greatness. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. It's a true honor. I've been a fan for a long time, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. And and I, I have to say that last week's episode, the Harwitz episode, has been our fastest growing episode on Inspiration for the Nation ever. We got 10,000 views on YouTube in the span of two days. It's clear that people really want to know the Harwitz story and and their their strength is 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 incredible and i have been getting such amazing feedback from that episode and and we have really strong people in Claudiusol and and again thank you to the Horowitzes for for sharing thank you so much for watching this episode with Hillel uh be like Hill go ahead and share this episode with people that would gain from it um there are so many good nuggets and notes in here that Hill shared I want to thank again our sponsors Simcha Time go ahead and I meant that story with Hill I mean it's two stories with Hill about random acts of kindness go ahead and do those acts of kindness bring simcha into people's lives and then go ahead at, on shabbos go around the table and talk about simcha time talk about what happened this week that you're like 
You have to hear what happened to me and what I did for someone else, as well as the unrestricted podcast. Yes, yes, definitely more sophisticated than my podcast with people that are incredible. I don't even know how how uh, Steve is getting them, but unrestricted podcast link in the show notes and go ahead and rate us five stars if you haven't yet. Go ahead on livingthechaim.com and tell us who you want me to interview or on Kosher Money or That's an Issue or Spirit of the Song or Charlene's podcast. We want to hear from you. We literally read every single comment. So go ahead and tell us who you want to hear. Until next time, keep on trying being inspirational. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.